Hi, I'm Steve Vest. I'm the host of today's FPB Meet the Candidates. This is a Cable 10 series that allows you, the viewer, to hear directly from the candidate on issues that are important to all of us. This is leading up to the general election on November 5th. Today's guest is Dan Fister, candidate for state representative in Kentucky's 56th district. I'd like to thank you uh, for coming by, taking some time to talk to us, and we're open it up with just tell us about yourself and why you've chosen this path of public service. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, as, as Steve just said, I am state representative Dan Fister. I am in my second term as as the representative in the 56th district. Um, I got into into politics uh, kind of by accident. My father-in-law uh, mentioned it to me one day, and I laughed at him when he did. But he made me promise to at least think about it. And and when I did, I I saw a need for for somebody to step up and do something. Um, our world is has got a lot of lot of moving parts that need to be addressed. Crime and and other issues and. Um, just felt like I needed to get involved and try to do that, and that's what I did. Um, I am a, uh, a husband, a father, a Christian. I have uh, two grown sons. My wife and I have been married for 46 years this year. Yeah. Uh, two grandkids, and if you don't have any, go rent some because they're oh. the coolest thing ever. And I've got two myself. Ever. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Outside of outside of being a, a state representative, what are you, what are you involved in? And well, um, I'm a retired general contractor. I did that for 34 years. I'm a lifelong farmer. Uh, I've worked in law enforcement. I currently manage some rental property and still still farm a little bit on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and I've pretty much dedicated to, to being the state representative. It's a it's truly a full-time job. Um, I've always done uh, some work with my church and nonprofits. Uh, I like to stay in the, out trying to help the public, yep. you know, and okay. that's about it. Well, um, what experience do you have other than that you're coming back to the seat that you were in right. that, that's going to help you in the future and, and help the legislature? That's a tough question. Um, I don't know that you can ever be truly experienced to, to go into this kind of work, but you have to be have a broad enough base mm -hmm. um, and enough exposure to things. I, um, I helped run a nonprofit in, in Wilmore for almost 20 years. I was president of that organization five different times. I think that kind of interaction with people sure. helped pre prepare me to do this. Um, running my own business for 34 years yeah. uh, gave, you, gave me some skills that would work. Uh, it's just drawing on life skills and being w willing to learn new ones as you go along. Right. Now, for, for our, our viewers that don't know, could you kind of give us the dimensions of House 56? The 56th district, it includes geographically about half of Franklin County. Okay. All of Woodford and mm -hmm. then a portion of Jessamine County. Okay. All right. Um, what, are the, what are the key issues that are facing the district? And what is the major issue facing the state? That's a tough question. Um, you know, start I, with the district. <laughs> well, the, I think I think in a lot of ways they're the same. Um, we've got crime issues, we've got education issues, uh, infrastructure issues. We put um, in this last budget, I think it was two point seven uh, billion dollars of one-time money. Then a good portion of that went into roads and schools and bridges and and those kind of things but uh yeah what what we're suffering from here in frankfurt is is very similar to what we're suffering from everywhere in the state okay so what are your legislative priorities well i am the vice chair of the house ag committee so okay. that kind of drives me in that direction um we've got some we've got a a situation on the horizon where we are losing farmland at a tremendous rate, and we need to address that. Um, I've done some work with the Farm Bureau here recently. They've got a plan to, to help 
I don't know, alleviate some of that. Right. Um, and I'm looking for ways to to handle it. We as humans need habitat, mm-hmm. but we also need farms to to grow our food. So we've got to find that that happy median. There's also an issue with um, countries that are not friendly to the United States coming in and buying up our our ag land. Yeah. Trying to stop some of that. Uh, we've got issues with uh, shortage of veterinarians. We addressed some of that this past session. I'm working with uh, Murray State University and some of the others to to help alleviate some of that as well. Okay. So, um, is there any specific piece of legislation or topic before the General Assembly that you believe the legislature should have passed in the past several years? And why? Well, every one of my bills that didn't pass, I, yeah. <laughs> I felt, felt like they should have. Um, you have any idea how many there were? Well, this past session, we had over 1,200 bills filed, and we only passed 212. Okay. So there was quite a few that didn't make the cut. Um, some, some were probably not worthy of being passed at all, and some needed to be worked on a little more. and. And some just didn't quite get there quick enough. Right. Um, but there's, I don't know. That's a that's a t- tough question to try to answer. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the pension. Okay. Um, Kentucky's underfunded pension system for state employees and public school teachers has been significant and a longstanding issue in the state. How would you pr- propose to ensure that the state meets its commitment to current retirees and those nearing retirement while also addressing the funding gap? Well, I think we're doing a pretty good job of that right now. Um, We started looking at it, I wasn't in the legislature at the time, but about uh, 2017, uh, when the the makeup of the the legislature changed in 2016, and the new new majority took a deep look at that, um, they started meeting the actuarial requirements making the funding issues that we need to make and and trying to get some handles and some guardrails on the system um, i'm not sure the percentages of funding now but we were the the second worst funded pitch pension system in the country and we're we've got it kind of under control it's 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 fragile but it's safe right at the moment okay um, we did a one-time um in addition to our actuarial contributions and, and those kind of things, we did a one-time uh, $600 million pay into the system to help help boost it a little bit more as well. Okay. Uh, what is your position on adjusting the benefits or cost of living adjustments for current retirees? I would love to do that. Um, the problem is, is the, is the system itself. I don't know that it's strong enough at this point. I much w- would much rather make sure they've got a check next month and the month after than to give them a little bit at this point. Um, um, a 13th, or, yeah, a 13th check, you know, that was discussed for a while. That's $150 million. Right. Um, coming out of the system to do that. And I don't know that one check helps a whole lot. Right. Uh, a 1% raise is $600 million. Uh, those are some big numbers considering yeah. what we've got to work with. So we've got to, we've got to find that fragile line and, and hold to it. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, moving on to education in Kentucky's public education system. How do you view the current curriculum standards? And are there any specific changes that you would like to ad- advocate for? I don't know. Um, there, there are some things that I think need to be taught that are not in the curriculum. Some I think we we did some work to put uh, cursive writing back in. Mm-hmm. I think we need to uh, concentrate a lot more on on reading and math and the and the science type skills. Um, I under I see all the time students that are that are graduating from high school that can't read and write mm-hmm. especially not on grade level right um, and that puts them out at a, at a huge disadvantage um, this is our future we're talking about and we've got to get these give these kids a chance yeah 
you know so yeah um do you support the expansion of charter schools in kentucky why or why not well we don't have them here yet so you can't say we're expanding them but uh, yes i like the program we've used something similar to it uh, fed and, and jefferson counties have used magnet schools the only difference between a magnet school and a, and a charter school is that magnet schools can discriminate as far as who they want to come in. They have to have certain grade levels or skill sets or what have you. Right. A charter school, according to the, the law that we've passed, they've got to, if they've got a seat, they have to accept a student for that. They can't uh, hold it back for, for whatever reason. So, okay. Yeah. Well, a constitutional amendment, too. Um, there were two constitutional amendments on the ballot this fall. Constitutional Amendment 2 would pass a new section to the Constitution allowing General Assembly to pass laws that support non-public school students financially. How do you think allowing financial support to private and non-public schools will impact public schools in Kentucky? And do you see any ri risk of public schools losing funding as a result? Well, let me let me back into that one. Okay. Uh, a lot of what we're hearing is that there, it's going to take money away from public schools, and that's absolutely not true. Um, it will not affect their funding. the The idea of of funding alternative ways of of educating our kids, every state that borders us has some form of that. They all have higher teacher salaries, higher retention better grade results. Um, we're 37th in the nation in education. I don't like being in that bottom 13. Right. You know, let's take it to the next level. Other states have done it, and they've had success with it, and I think we can do that here in Kentucky as well. Okay. Um, uh, supporters of the amendment maintain that it, ex that it expands educational choice. How would you ensure that this financial support is equally distributed so that low-income families have equal access? Well, that, that would have to uh, still to be written is how that yeah. law and process will be. Um, and I have full faith in the legislature as, as a whole to be able to do that. Um, I don't want to say it'll be a voucher or, a, you know, write a check or what have you, but but it will be handled fairly the same as the money is handled now for the public schools. Okay. You know? Uh, tax policy. There's been an effort in the tax code changes to move towards more of a consumption-based tax code, expanding sales tax and reducing individual tax. How would you ensure that any changes do not disproportionately impact low- and middle-income residents? Well, let, let's be honest. Anything that happens typically impacts low and, and middle income people uh, more so than, than anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the long run, changing our tax code to a consumption style tax uh, actually spreads the tax more fairly. You know, it allows the people that are running a quote cash economy to start paying their taxes. Um, right. And it, and it makes it a more balanced, fair tax all the way across the board. Okay. What we've done in cutting our taxes, uh, every time we lower that, that individual income tax a half a percent, we're putting $300, million, or $300 billion. Let me get that right now. It's a billion dollars. It goes back into the pockets of taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And that's the poor people. That's the rich people. That's everybody. Okay. Um, do, do you uh, see or think there'll be lost revenue if certain taxes are reduced or eliminated? Or do well, you think it comes out of that money goes back to them? Well, it, it the lost revenue, um, I think it balances, you know, okay. depending on what taxes you're cutting and which ones you're raising. But, but if it's done logically, I think it, it balances. Okay. Um, constitutional Amendment Number 1. Um, Clarify voting rights in Kentucky by explicitly stating that only U.S. citizens can vote in the state. Why do you believe this is necessary? 
um, to prohibit non-citizens from voting in Kentucky elections when federal law already limits voting to U.S. citizens? Well, because it's happening in other states. Okay. I mean, it's it, the, the barn doors open. It just hadn't gotten to Kentucky yet. Okay. Uh, let's secure our elections. I see no no reason not to do it. I think it was understood a couple of hundred years ago when our Constitution was was written that that's the way it would be. Okay. Um, let's get it get it in writing and, and secure that. Okay. So, do you see any unintended legal or constitutional consequences? From arising from this amendment, if it is passed, I don't, I don't see where it's. You know, people will sue you over anything. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that may happen, but no, I don't see where there's any unintended consequences from it. Okay. Well, how do you plan to work across party lines to address issues that are unique to Central Kentucky, particularly in areas where state-level decisions heavily impact the local economy or the infrastructure? Same way I've always done it. Um, to show show the relationship I have across the political aisle. When my father-in-law passed away this spring, um, one of the Democrat legislators came to me and said, can I do a, a citation for him? Mm -hmm. You know, we were close enough that they, they felt a need to do that. A need to do that. Right. Um, I work with anybody. I mm -hmm. don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or even a registered voter. If you need help, come to me. I'm there. Okay. Um, and that's the way I've approached it all the way down the line. Okay. Uh, how do you plan to foster collaboration between state and local government and address pressing issues like health care, access, job creation, and infrastructure in Franklin County? Well, again, the same way I've always done it. Uh, Mayor Wilkerson and uh, uh, Judge uh, Mueller have, have been in my office many, many, many times. Yeah. We, we've got a good relationship. Um, in fact, I have actually sat on my f couch at home at 10 o'clock at night and talked to the mayor on my cell phone because we were trying to hammer out some issues in the 11th hour. Right. Um, and I will continue that as long as I'm in public service. Okay. Um, Historic preservation and tourism. Frankfurt is home to many historic sites. How would you work to preserve these sites while encouraging tourism and economic development in the district? Well, I'm actually on the Tourism and, and Outdoor Recreation Committee, mm -hmm. and we've done a lot of work here in Frankfurt and, and across the state, uh, Fort Herod and, and those different kind of places. Um, I'm 100% behind it, okay. you know. Um, give them the resources that they need and, and, and whatever help they ask for. Every project's different, you know, so there, there's no um, magic wand that, that fixes everything. But, yes, right. I'm very supportive of it. Okay. Uh, reproductive rights and health. Do you support maintaining or overturning the current restrictions on abortion access in Kentucky? I am pro-life, and I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, I believe that uh, human life is sacred. Now, as far as what we come out, come up with as a legislature and, and what rules we have, um, that's yet to be seen, but uh, I currently support what is, what is there at the current time. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you support any exceptions? Personally, no. Okay. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's... You know some possibilities out there that I haven't thought about, but I haven't seen any that. that well, so this cases thing. of rape, incest, right. health of the mother. You're still talking about a human being. Okay. You know, um, whether however it was conceived uh, or what age it is, you know, I say jokingly sometimes there's an argument for for getting rid of teenagers, you know, yeah. because they they give you gray hair, but. There's truly no reason to uh, wholesale kill babies, kill humans. Okay. Um, Kentucky has one of the more has one of the highest matern, uh, maternal uh, mortality rates. It's a hard mm -hmm. uh, tongue twister. It's a mouthful. Yeah. Yeah. In the in the country, what policies would you support to improve mater, maternal health and reduce pregnancy related deaths? Are there anything anything there? <sighs> I don't have anything specific on my list, but uh, 
I was at a um, um, pregnancy help center uh, event last night, um, helped fund some of those private organizations. I was over at one of the birthing centers in, in Indiana, uh, been about three weeks ago for a visit. We, we tried to do some birthing center issues here and didn't quite get them across the line this past legislative session. I'm very supportive of that. Um, we've got to, there's a lot needs to be done in our health care system to make it more accessible and, mm -hmm. and to bring in the professionals that we need. Right. Um, and I think it's all part of that same picture. Okay. Well, we uh, Kentucky has been severely affected by the opi opioid crisis. What specific mm -hmm. policies would you support to tackle substance abuse and expand access to addiction treatment and recovery? I'm thinking a lot of it is continuation of what we're doing. You know, we've got to give law enforcement the tools to to do their job. Uh, we have to get behind our rehab facilities. I think we've gone after the uh, the perpetrators, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, the pharmaceutical companies. We've got them back at the table helping fund some of this. Um, I guess the next component is education, but but we're talking about humans, and they are human. They will will make mistakes and and fall victim to, to certain things, and and so it's it's a process we're going to have to go through. Okay. Um, what steps would you take to prevent homelessness and provide support for vulnerable populations, including veterans and low-income families? Well, once again, we're, we're on that same track. Um, you know, we've, we've done things to improve our economy. Mm -hmm. We've got people going back to work. Um, we've got a, a good um, safety net out there that's working well. Um, I think we just need to, to keep working with that. And, okay. we need to, and we need to involve our nonprofits. Um, Catholic Action Center over in Lexington comes to mind. There's several that in our area and in our district that uh, do that kind of work and, and support these people. Okay. Well, here's, here's an easy one for you. You ready? Okay. <laughs> what makes you the best candidate? And uh, – if you want to address this to the camera, you can do that. Um, tell them a little bit more about yourself, where they can find find information about you, and and ask ask our viewers for your for their vote. Okay, um, I think what makes me the best candidate is that I am experienced. I have uh, um, a proven track record. I care, and like I said earlier, I don't care if you're. Uh, a registered voter or not if you have an issue please reach out to me i'm more than happy to help you you can find out more about me at danfister.com uh, or dan fister for state representative on facebook um, don't hesitate to reach out and, and ask questions i will will ask you for your vote on november the 5th and ask that you not only vote but but go vote early if you can and uh Get your friends and neighbors to go and vote as well. Being a being a good citizen is not a spectator sport. You've got to get up off the couch and, and do your part, and that that's the big part of it is voting. So well, thank Rep you. Well, Representative Fister, thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to ask our, our viewers to remember to get out and vote on Tuesday, November 5th. Then tune in to Cable 10 to uh, see the results broadcast from the county clerk's office. Thanks for joining us today and have a great one.